cooperation and collaboration across the world and across your generation to salvage uh, some uh, the human values that uh, Alama Iqbal uh, aspired to. So it's a sp especially meaningful for me to give a lecture in his memory and especially in the memory of, of his purposes. Uh, I originally titled this talk, uh, The uh, Geopolitics in, in a Changing World, but I have rechristened it uh, this evening as The Geopolitics of Peace, because that's what we really need. The idea of this lecture is to try to find some solutions to a geopolitics of war right now. We're obviously in the middle of a extraordinarily dangerous and destructive hot war in Ukraine. And we are unbelievably uh, talking daily now about the prospects of a war in Asia. It's too horrific to contemplate. Uh, and yet it is the casual discourse and the op-ed columns uh, in our media uh, that we need to be prepared for the U.S.-China war in 2025 and so forth. These ideas are horrifying. The people who write them are not thinking straight uh, or are not knowledgeable or are utterly irresponsible. We cannot afford a continuation of the current war, and God forbid we cannot afford a war between the U.S. and China. It will be the end of civilization if it comes to that. The ideas that people have that, well, this is just a controllable conflict, or if you happen to read in our media, in the English language press, especially in the UK and the US, well, don't worry about it. It's unlikely that Putin will use nuclear weapons or don't be blackmailed and so forth. Don't be afraid. Let me tell you, be afraid. Have some sense. That's really what I want to talk about tonight. The world is not in safe hands right now on any side, not the government here, not the government in the United States, not governments around the world. They're dangerous to your health. And it is our responsibility, especially in a venue like this, which is frankly, one of my favorite places in the whole world, Oxford University, and a, a meeting like this, one of my favorite moments of life to be in a packed room with people that are thinking and are interested in thinking because we need to think right now and we need to think clearly and our lives truly depend on it. So, I've been thinking a lot uh, about uh, the Ukraine war. I'd say morning, noon, and night. I'm very concerned and very upset because this is a war that is extraordinarily dangerous. It's a war that never should have happened. This is not simply a war that Putin decided unprovoked to launch in uh, February 24th, 2022. That's nonsense for anyone who has been around. Just to tell you, I'm an old guy. I've been around. Okay. I was an advisor to President Mikhail Gorbachev. I was an advisor to President Boris Yeltsin. I was an advisor to President Leonid Kuchma, the first president of independent Ukraine and to others. I've been around. What you are being told about this conflict and others is not true. That's not a hunch. That's not an academic idea. That is direct knowledge firsthand for more than 30 years.
and I want to explain these ideas. But most importantly, I want this to be a constructive session, problem solving. And the point I want to make is shown on this slide. We're here to talk about international relations. Geopolitics is part of the field of international relations. International relations is a field of study of the interaction of states. And there are many sound and good ideas in international relations theory, but I want to make a basic proposition that international relations theory is not just a description of the causes of war or the causes of war and peace, but the prescription of the way to peace as well. International relations theory should be inherently a normative field, not only a positive or descriptive field. It's not good enough to explain war. We don't have medical schools to explain disease. We have medical schools to cure disease. We don't have schools of public health to explain epidemics or only to explain epidemics. We have schools of public health to prevent or to control epidemics. It's not for those disciplines merely prediction or merely explanation. If you are a cosmologist, it probably is a matter of explanation that you're after. But if you are in a discipline such as health or international relations or economics, I believe you are inherently in a moral field. Moral in the sense that you are inherently trying to improve the world. And the field of international relations should be a field to solve the problems of war. I want to hear from the universities how this war can end, not simply how to escalate more armaments. We're not hearing enough of that from the universities, frankly. And I want international relations theory to address the prescriptions for peace. And I'm going to give you a few. Uh, you may accept them or not accept them, but I believe that this is our business to try to design better solutions. One of the reasons for this is a very important statement by the, the favorite president of my lifetime, President John F. Kennedy. And I'll explain in my talk why he is my favorite president. I don't have very many favorite presidents, by the way. I think most of our presidents have been mediocrities or worse. Uh, some outright criminals, some emotionally, pathologically imbalanced, uh, and, a, and a couple great leaders. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, the greatest of our leaders for a reason that I will explain. John F. Kennedy, the greatest leader of my lifetime. He said in his inaugural address, a very important thing to keep in mind because it is essentially the existential reality of our time. And it's the core of my view of the challenge of international relations theory. He said, the world is very different now for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. That's January 20th, 1961. This is the modern reality. We have technologies that are remarkable, so remarkable that if we put our mind to it, poverty could be ended. Education could be accessible to every child in the world. We could have universal health coverage. We could ensure that basic economic needs are met by all. We could give young people the tools for productive lives. This is all within reach and not just within reach in a 
uh, idealistic sense, but in a very practical sense. But those same technologies, that same breakthrough in science of how semiconductors work or how solid state physics works is also the same technology that enables us to make thermonuclear weapons to destroy the world through nuclear war or through our reckless abandonment of the environment. Uh, it's something that Kennedy didn't think about. He was clearly referring to nuclear war. One thing to keep in mind in my talk is that Kennedy came in more sensitive to this subject than any president of modern history, yet he nearly stumbled into full-scale nuclear war in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And this is something telling for us also, because the world is difficult and complicated. And even if you come in with the wisdom of this statement, because of how state power works and misfunctions and terrible blunders by Kennedy in the early stages of his government, especially the invasion of Cuba in the spring of 1961 and the lies that he told about it initially. And he's my favorite president. Uh, this, by his actions and the subsequent actions of the Soviet chairman Nikita Khrushchev, brought us to not just the brink of nuclear war, but seconds of within the launch of nuclear war. And that's how dangerous our world is. That's what I want you to know. And therefore, when you're told, don't worry, you're reading something from foolish people. Because if you're not worried, you don't get it. And we need to pull back from the brink through the things I'm going to talk about rather than to push to the brink in this lackadaisical way that passes for the mainstream media. So one of the powerful books of international relations is written by one of America's leading scholars. And many of you have probably watched videotapes of him in the last year because he's been one of the leaders of, and I have been together with him on this of trying to explain the Ukraine war through the provocations of the United States. John Mearsheimer is a professor at University of Chicago, and he wrote a very powerful book in 2002 called The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. It's an excellent book of international relations but it does not meet the standard that I put on the first slide. It is descriptive and powerfully descriptive. It talks about the tragedy of great power politics, meaning the wars that we fight. And while I admire John Mearsheimer enormously and we're friends and we speak and communicate with each other often, I want to go farther than this because Mearsheimer says that the tragedy is inevitable of great power politics. And I don't believe we can accept tragedy as our fate, especially in the world that John F. Kennedy described. Tragedy in the past meant World War I or World War II. Tragedy in the future means the end of the world because our technologies have brought the end of the world within reality, especially nuclear war. So we can't, in my opinion, accept an international relations, however descriptive, however predictive it is, we can't accept that as the end of international relations. We have to accept that as the start of international relations because we need not the tragedy of great power politics, but the solution 
to the tragedy of great power politics. We need the great power peace. And I hope one of you will write that soon. Uh, I'm going to give you a few tips on some of the chapters. <laughs> so what John Mearsheimer wrote is very powerful. And I just want to read it because it's really <laughs> what is keeping me up at night and keeping me worried. He wrote, the sad fact is that international politics has always been a ruthless and dangerous business, and it is likely to remain that way. Although the intensity of their competition waxes and wanes, great powers fear each other and always compete with each other for power. The overriding goal of each state is to maximize its share of world power, which means gaining power at the expense of other states. But great powers do not merely strive to be the strongest of all the great powers, although that is a welcome outcome. Their ultimate aim is to be the hegemon. That is the only great power in the system. <laughs> and he says there are three features that lead to that. The absence of central authority, so international anarchy. In other words, there's no global leviathan in Hobbesian terms. There's only anarchy at the top. And then states thrusting for power within that anarchic system. Second, the fact that states have offensive military capabilities. So you have to be aware that someone can launch the surprise attack or the first strike and that that's a devastating fact. And third, that states can never be certain about each other's intentions and therefore the best guarantee of survival is to be a hegemon because no other state can seriously threaten such a mighty power. Now, we can already reason. Isn't it a tragedy if everyone is trying to be number one? There's a little bit of a paradox there that that means endless strife, an impossibility of different nations achieving that goal. And perhaps everybody ending up dead as a result of that struggle. But that is John Mearsheimer's uh, point that this is the tragedy of great power politics. And he says, since no state is likely to achieve global hegemony, the world is condemned to perpetual great power competition. That's realism in international relations theory. And there is nobody that, uh, uh, that uh, has developed that theory more effectively and cogently than John Mearsheimer. And incidentally, this book was written in 2002 at a time when the US had normal relations with China. It had normal relations with Russia. It seemed a calm world. The American exceptionalists felt very great about themselves, that it's the American world after all. And nobody much was talking about great power tragedy. And John Mearsheimer, to his descriptive and predictive credit, said, this will not go on. We will go back to conflict. And there is no way that China is going to rise without U.S.-China conflict. And he predicted all of this absolutely correctly. And that is the power of these ideas. But they are tragic. And so they are not quite powerful enough because we have not yet had the power to surmount the tragedy, and that's what we need. So I want to talk about peace, and I want to talk about peace as the avoidance of war, and I want, as a non-IR specialist, I'm an economist who has been engaged in global economic diplomacy for 40 years to talk about international relations and war as I see it. But acknowledging, uh, I would like uh, to see the solutions come out of international relations as a 
normative theory of peace. So I believe we need to start with differentiating the kinds of wars that we are aiming to avoid because they're not the same in all contexts. And therefore, we're not talking about the same thing when we talk about peace in different contexts. And since all categorizations are oversimplifications, what I'm going to say is an oversimplification, but oversimplifications in theory are meant to be useful. And I believe this is useful. So I want to distinguish three categories of war. One are wars of the empire or wars of plunder. A second is the great power conflicts. That is the fights for who's number one that Mearsheimer features in the tragedy of great power politics. And the third is inter-ethnic conflict, conflict between groups. And I believe these are distinctive and they require not only distinctive, descriptive and predictive theories, but also distinctive, I'm sorry, distinctive uh, predictive uh, um, theories, but also distinctive prescriptive uh, normative approaches of how to stop these wars. So what are wars of plunder? Uh, wars of imperial plunder certainly include the British conquest of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, they include uh, the European conquest of Africa at the end of uh, the 19th century. They include uh, the United States' destruction of Native American nations, especially in the second half of the 19th century, a kind of series of genocides that aren't even counted as genocides because when you're number one, you don't have to explain and history somehow disappears. Uh, but uh, this was a, a period of destroying many nations in the United States. It was interesting to me, since I am generally sympathetic to China on most issues uh, and not fearing China, as I'm going to explain, somebody wrote to me, well, Mr. Sachs, you're so naive. Look at how China treats its various minorities. Uh, and I could only say, well, yes, the United States killed those minorities. Uh, one group we enslaved and then kept under apartheid for another century, the African Americans. Uh, so I think the Americans treated their minorities worse. Uh, they're not even present anymore, uh, except small numbers on Indian reservations. So it's all a matter of perspective. So these are wars of imperial plunder. Great power wars are wars of hegemonic competition. Uh, we could go back uh, to the Peloponnesian Wars. We could even go back to, uh, in, in a way, the wars of uh, Persia and uh, ancient Greece uh, that Herodotus, uh, of course, uh, wrote about in the first history, the histories. Uh, but uh, Athens and Sparta of the Peloponnesian uh, Wars from 431 BC to 404 BC certainly uh, qualifies as uh, hegemonic wars, but within a smaller context. World War I, it was clearly a great power conflict, World War II. And then we should be clear that there are also proxy wars that are hegemonic wars. The Vietnam War was not a war really between the United States and Vietnam. It was a war between the United States and the communist world, especially the Soviet Union uh, and uh, China, uh, in which Vietnam was the battleground. The Ukraine war is not a war between Russia and Ukraine, despite what you read every day. It is primarily a war between Russia and the United States, uh, and it needs to be understood in those terms. By the way, as enthusiastic as the British press is for the war, that's mainly nostalgia because uh, Britain fought this war between 1853 and 1856. It's called the Crimean War. They loved it. Uh, Boris Johnson wanted to be Palmerston uh, again. Uh, and uh, that was also a hegemonic war. It was a battle between 
Britain and France on one side and Russia, uh, the Russian Empire on the other side. So those are great power politics in the Mearsheimer sense. And then there are inter-ethnic wars. Israel and Palestine is an example of that. Uh, Ethiopian war that is now at a ceasefire, maybe ending, is an inter-ethnic war. India-Pakistan wars are complicated, of course, but to a significant extent, they are inter-ethnic wars. Uh, and uh, these are quite distinctive. Uh, the wars are not hegemonic wars. The wars are clashes of cultures, clashes of societies, uh, and uh, clashes of religion, uh, actually. So basically, wars of plunder are wars of the strong versus the weak, and they are wars of injustice. Wars of great powers are wars of the strong versus the strong, and they're wars basically of competition. And wars of inter-ethnic conflict, I will say, are wars of the weak versus the weak, people who are fearful uh, and fighting out of fear uh, rather than out of a sense of uh, wanting to dominate. They want to escape from fear. So as an economist, my observations are that economic change of various kinds lead wars or are more conducive to wars. And I wrote a book in 2020 based on lectures that I very happily gave at Oxford in 2017 called The Ages of Globalization, uh, where I describe how technology and institutional change and physical geography interact to produce long-term global change across many different ages of globalization. But one of the notable facts of that uh, study is that each new epoch driven by technological change was typically accompanied by war. And technology, technological change uh, in various ways leads to changes of relative power, and changes of relative power lead to wars of the kinds that I've described. So technological divergence, meaning that the more advanced technological countries gain some kind of decisive advantage over the others lead to wars of plunder. Imperial wars are basically wars in which there is a more powerful adversary, usually based on more powerful economics and underlying military technologies that allow for an expansion of empire. Technological convergence means that the poorer countries are catching up with the richer countries. Surprisingly, that's also conducive to war, but typically to the wars of competition, because as the poorer countries are narrowing the gap with the richer countries, the two come into direct competition with each other. So periods of technological convergence tend to be periods of wars of competition. And I believe that's the dominant form of war that we have now and why the great power conflicts are raging the way they are. Shared vulnerability of various kinds, even economic vulnerabilities, poverty, and so forth, lead to wars of fear and to inter-ethnic violence. There is a absolute uh, fact that at higher income levels, less hunger, longer life expectancy, inter-ethnic or intergroup uh, struggles tend to diminish in fervor. There is the added fact of poverty on and desperation over resources on top of the facts of the intergroup stress that are conducive to this third kind of war. So just as some quick example, the great engine of 19th century divergence was the steam engine. This is probably the most important invention of the last thousand years, uh, in fact, in both economics and in geopolitics. It happened to be invented uh, in Britain, uh, in 
actually uh, in a, a workshop in the University of Glasgow uh, by a very skilled uh, and, and a very uh, uh, creative inventor, James Watt. And he was able to improve John Newcomen's uh, uh, 1712 steam engine and to patent a new steam engine in 1776. And boy, was that a good thing to do from the point of view of economic power, productivity, industrialization, interocean transport, and military force. Britain became the first industrial society. It towered over the rest of the world in economic, financial, military might. And that led to the so-called Second British Empire of the 19th century. So we see one of the great turns of history. These are the usual data that Angus Madison and his team developed on global output. This is uh, the shares of world output of Asia and the North Atlantic regions between 1820 and 2019. And what you see is that as late as 1820, Asia had 60% of world output. And as late as 1820, the Indian subcontinent was the manufacturing center of the world. It was still the textile center of the world. We were just in a workshop in Varanasi, uh, India, just a few days ago, making silk textiles now by a power loom, but it would have been done by hand looms two centuries ago, but it would have been the center of the world textile industry really as late as 1800. In 1790, the steam engine was connected to a belt to move uh, the, the spinning jennies and to move the power looms. And the rest, uh, one could say, history. Britain used every trick in the book. Uh, protectionism, control over the ports, military force, and mechanization to destroy the Indian uh, textile industry in the early 19th century. Uh, and to subjugate India afterwards. But if you look at the red line, you see that in 1820, Asia had 60% of the world population. And then it went on a sharp downward course thereafter. And it reached its nadir in 1950 at 20% of the world population. Now, Asia having 60% of the world population, 60% uh, of world output take care, Asia had 60% of the world population. So in 1820, per capita income in Asia and the rest of the world was roughly the same, not exactly, but roughly the same. And per capita income in Asia plummeted, per capita income in the North Atlantic region, meaning Europe and uh North America, Canada, and the United States soared. And these lines cross. It happens around 1857. Uh, that's a coincidence because this is just a linear extrapolation. But 1857 is, of course, the notable date of the uh, Sepoy Rebellion, uh, the Indian Rebellion. And in 1858, the whole Indian subcontinent falls under what becomes the British Raj. Uh, and that change of power was a uh, war of plunder made possible by this differential economic performance. Now, notice that the largest gap between the North Atlantic and Asia occurs in 1950, basically. And from then on, the lines start to converge again. This is extremely important to understand because it is in 1947 that India and Pakistan become independent countries and 1949, the People's Republic of China becomes a new independent country after decades of invasion and civil war. And it is that independence which gives the base for a subsequent era of convergence. 
So broadly speaking, in economic history, the period from 1800 to 1950 is a period of divergence, growing power of the North Atlantic relative to the rest of the world. It's the period of European imperialism, high imperialism, not the first colonies, but the conquests of large land areas. The period after 1950, broadly speaking, is the period of economic convergence. The basic reason for convergence is sovereignty. The basic reason that sovereignty matters is that this is the beginning of mass education. Pakistan and India in 1950 had illiteracy of 90%. There was no mass education because that's the essence of empire is do not provide education. And without education, there was no economic possibility other than subjugation. And so independence is fundamental for changing the direction. And that's why the world changes because that is the end of World War II, and it's the beginning of independence across the world from European empires, and it enabled the beginning of mass education. Well, this was that whole period of the that 150 years from 1800 to uh, 1950 was a pretty tough period. Uh, many of you have probably seen this book called All the Countries, uh, we ever invaded and the few we never got around to by Stuart Laylock, 2012. Uh, the countries in white, there are 22 of them out of the 193 UN member states never had uh, an attack by Britain. It's fascinating. Britain was definitely the most violent country in the world in the 19th century. Uh, and um, the United States, in my view, is the most violent country in the world after 1950. And yet these are supposed liberal democracies. But the basic point is liberal democracy has almost nothing to do with peaceful foreign policy. Foreign policy is about relative power. Uh, and uh, Britain used its relative power to conquer a large part of the world. And for the parts that it didn't conquer, it at least invaded uh, or went to war at various times. So don't ever make the confusion of liberalism or democracy and peace. These are different concepts, uh, different motivations, different reasons. Uh, and historically, uh, not correlated or possibly anti-correlated for this odd reason. So what are the, the main solutions to wars of plunder? There are two. One, technological convergence. Narrow the gap so that the rich can't exploit the poor. And the second is collective security to protect the weak from the strong through collective security, such as the United Nations aims to achieve. Now, as I've said, the end of European imperial rule led to a shift from divergence to convergence, and one might have hoped that would end the imperial wars. Of course, there was a trailing edge of 30 years of the final stages of imperialism, for example, the Vietnam War, which <laughs> raged until 1975, which was a war of independence from France and then taken over by the United States. Algeria, <laughs> Indonesia, <laughs> and so forth. But by and large, uh, the shift from divergence to convergence reduced the wars of plunder without question. And why the age of convergence? As I've said, independent states introduced education. There was an accelerated diffusion of technology, markets for technology, the spread of digital technologies is nearly ubiquitous, even to some of the poorest places in the world. We were, my wife and I were in a village uh, in Kenya, completely impoverished uh, 
like you cannot even imagine. I won't dwell on this except to say that there, in this tiny village, impoverished people, there were mobile phones and very small uh, solar uh, cell for charging them on a thatched roof. And so even digital had reached this community uh, and enabled at least a phone call for an emergency. Uh, and uh, this is part of the diffusion of technology and also equalizing deterrence through nuclear weapons. There have still been wars of plunder and uh, major powers still defeat weaker nations, but they don't subdue them anymore. Algeria, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria are all examples of mostly the United States, also France, fighting uh, these wars, but failing uh, in the wars of plunder. So technological convergence really does reduce the wars of plunder, but it also leads to more great power conflict. That's the Mearsheimer tragedy, because as countries come together in power, they compete more aggressively for domination. And an example, well, visions of that rising powers fear that they'll be held back by incumbent powers. That was Japan's fear in 1941. That was uh, Germany's uh, fear uh, in 1914. That was uh, maybe China's realistic assessment now that the United States is trying to contain China's rise. Uh, and so the United States is a deep threat to China's future. Incumbent powers fear they'll be overtaken by rising powers. Uh, that's uh, the so-called Thucydides trap. And the wars among the would-be hegemons, the leading powers, are the most destructive. So Graham Allison at the Kennedy School of Government wrote a widely read book a few years ago called Destined for War, Can America and China Escape Thucydides Trap? The analogy being that as Athens rose in power in the 5th century BC, uh, that eventually triggered war between, in this interpretation based on Thucydides, between the leading military power Sparta and the rising power Athens, uh, and that that was the basis for the Peloponnesian War, which ended up destroying both countries, by the way. That's the tragedy. Neither Sparta nor Athens won the Peloponnesian Wars. Sparta did technically, but it was soon disappeared, soon disappeared from the map. Uh, and uh, this is uh, these wars are negative sum wars. So an example of a rising power through convergence is Germany's economic rise from 1870 to 1914. <laughs> and you can see that according to these same data of Angus Madison, that Germany crosses uh, the UK GDP actually around 1905 and war ensues uh, around 1915. 14. Of course, I won't get into all the debates and complexities of World War I, except to say it was a tragedy of great powers. Uh, each of the powers felt extremely vulnerable to the others, and uh, especially Germany, France, UK, and, uh, and uh, the Habsburg Empire. Well, we're in a similar situation now. According to the International Monetary Fund, China overtook the United States in total output in 2011. These are GDP measured at purchasing power prices, not at market exchange rates. So that's just important as a technical matter. But it means that China is now the larger economy. I say, well, what do you expect? China has four times the population of the United States. Of course, it's going to be a larger economy, except if China remains perennially poor. Technically, if China remains at less than one-fourth the per capita income of the United States. But why should that be? China is enormously 
productive, creative, innovative, hardworking. The education system is excellent. So why wouldn't China rise in relative economic terms? And of course they have, and now it's a larger power. As Mearsheimer predicted uncannily in 2002, he said this will lead to the onset of hostility. I have to say he was right. I was certainly wrong because I've been engaged with China for 40 years now. Many of my students are senior officials in China. Many are academics in China. And I could never imagine that we would have these tensions because China is not a threat to the world. Only in our newspapers is a threat to the world. Now our newspapers are hysterically pointing out that it is a threat to the world. By the way, I'm convinced by people who have never been to China, these pundits, so-called. In general, as you get older, it's harder to read newspapers in general. <laughs> Stop me uh, before I become vulgar. Um, but what Mearsheimer said came true. As China got bigger, per se, China became an enemy. And a couple of days ago, the U.S. Congress held hearings on China's threat. Now, I guarantee those people, they probably don't even have a passport, those congressmen. They know nothing because I know them. So I'm just... I'm just giving you a hint. But Mearsheimer's right. Threat, counter threat, escalation of rhetoric, daily columns about the coming war. And sure enough, you have tragedy. So this is what convergence is bringing. Incidentally, the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, are now larger than the G7 countries. This is rather remarkable. To my mind, great, because it means economic convergence taking place. It means a narrowing of the gap. It means that the strange divergence of the industrial era from roughly 1750, I'll say, until 1950, which produced the North Atlantic-led world, is over good. Why should the North Atlantic, with 10% of the world population, lead the world? That was obviously an artificial aspect. James Watt came up with a great invention. The North Atlantic developed on the basis of that. I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but the basic idea is that one small part of the world should not morally and ethically dominate the rest. And the mechanics of domination don't exist. But with this convergence comes tension and new forms of war. So let me just put a moment of game theory here to say that the great power politics, the tragedy of the great power politics, is, in my view, well depicted by the famous prisoner's dilemma. And the prisoner's dilemma, of course, is the game theory concept developed in 1950 of how in a social dilemma in which two parties can either cooperate or cheat, even though cooperation is mutually beneficial, they end up cheating. And that's a tragedy because both end up worse off. The way it works, if you're not familiar with the prisoner's dilemma, is in this matrix, the well-being or metric of well-being for the first player, the rose, which is the US in this illustration, uh, is the first number in each quadrant. So if both the US and Russia de-escalate, each side gets five. 
But if the U.S. de-escalates and Russia escalates, the U.S. loses big time. It's, in other words, like a unilateral disarmament, and the other side doesn't disarm and wins the geopolitical prize. So the U.S. loses 10, but Russia gains 10 if the U.S. is, quote, foolish enough to de-escalate while Russia escalates. And the idea of the prisoner's dilemma is straightforward. If Russia, which is the columns in this matrix, de-escalates, the U.S. says, well, if we de-escalate, we get five. But if we escalate, we get 10. So if Russia de-escalates, we should escalate because then we get the advantage. What about if Russia escalates? Well, if we de-escalate, disaster, we get minus 10. But if we also escalate, not good, but not as bad as de-escalating, minus five. So whatever Russia does, our best strategy is to escalate. This is the so-called dominant strategy of this game. So whatever Russia plays, whether it de-escalates or escalates, we should escalate. And of course, it's a symmetrical game. So Russia says, whatever the U.S. does, we should escalate. And so what is the so-called equilibrium of this game predicted by game theory and essentially built into the tragedy of great powers? Both sides escalate. That's Mearsheimer's point, that that is the rational action to take if each side is playing for its advantage, taking it as given what the other country is doing. So both sides escalate. We have a war in Ukraine and both sides lose. Of course, Ukraine loses the most. So I don't have this really depicting exactly the Ukraine war, I want to be clear. But the idea is that the U.S. and Russia both escalate. What does this mean in practice? The U.S. pushes NATO enlargement and Russia pushes war to stop NATO enlargement. And you end up with a disaster for both sides. You look at that and say, hmm, guys, could you sit down and have a look? This isn't working very well for you. You're stuck in a disaster. Wouldn't it be good for both of you to chill, sit down? Maybe U.S., I have an idea, don't expand NATO. Just stay out. Russia, go home. Let Ukraine live. Stop fighting over Ukraine. And actually, U.S., you'll be better off. You'll have five. Russia, you'll be better off. You'll have five. And that is actually the right answer for my first proposition, that international relations theory should be a theory of how to get to de-escalate, de-escalate not a theory of why we end up at escalate, escalate. We don't have that theory now. If you say, as I do every day, why don't you negotiate? Well, you're called a Putin apologist. You're denied access to the Western media. You're deemed to be a fool and so forth. Frankly, we are in a tragedy. We are in the tragedy of great power politics, and it's getting worse because, as Mearsheimer rightly says, you don't just end up with a static minus five, minus five. You end up with continuing escalation. The end of continuing escalation is nuclear war. There's nothing beyond that, but there's nothing that stops the escalation to that. If Ukraine were really to be armed to invade Crimea, well, there would then be nuclear war. You would be told moments before we all are destroyed, don't worry about it. My advice to you is worry about it because we don't want to get there. So the idea is we need to move from the bottom right cell to the top left cell.
because it's mutually beneficial, but we don't have an international relations theory that is adequate for this. That's what we are searching for. I believe that there are two answers to that. In game theory, there is a famous finding, and the famous finding is if you let people playing the prisoner's dilemma talk with each other before they play, even without any binding agreement, they will cooperate 90% of the time. And so the mere human touch of negotiation changes the game fundamentally, even though it's not binding. And this, I believe, is key. How many times has President Biden spoken with President Putin during the year since the war started? I'll give you a hint. It's less than one. <laughs> and it's an integer. It is zero. So this is not grown up. Five-year-olds would do better. So I believe that the two answers to this first is a point that John F. Kennedy made in his inaugural address, same speech, where he said, let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. We need to sit down to talk. It's surprising how talking is a human activity that makes a substantive difference in allowing a solution to a social dilemma. The other is a point that Ronald Reagan emphasized. Agreement is not based on trust. It's not based on naivete. It is trust, but verify. Finally, let me turn to the third kind of war, and that is inter-ethnic violence and the social structures of fear. Intercommunal violence is a special kind of war. It is conflict amplified by group identity with very little communication between groups. Open hostility, typically long lasting, very high fear factors on both sides. Both sides are typically prisoners of history. As my wife says, those who can't forget history are condemned to repeat it, the opposite of the usual idea. Uh, when you are stuck in intercommunal conflict, if you can't forget the past that they did this to us, then there is the constant, constant provocation that more will come and that it's impossible to reach peace. There are very few structures of protection for communities. So the fear is very, very high. And we don't have a developed jurisprudence or political structure in most of history about group rights, which we need. So the United States does not have a concept of group rights, for example. In fact, we're now uh, going to probably see the end of so-called affirmative action in the United States because it violates individual rights will be the Supreme Court's likely decision. We don't have a concept of how in a diverse multi-ethnic community, different ethnicities can have rights. Actually, the Ottoman Empire, in my view, did a pretty good job of this. The Ottoman Empire was a multi-ethnic community with a millet system in which there was self-jurisdiction to an important extent of non Muslim populations uh, and rights to practice religions within that. These uh, non-Muslim populations were uh, not of the social stature of the Muslim populations in the Ottoman period, but they had an autonomy uh, and they had a governance structure. They paid taxes, millet taxes, but there were group rights and those group rights were important. We've lost even the uh, search for group rights in our, uh, I think, ideologies of liberalism uh, and in our constitutional designs. And this makes intercommunal conflict more likely and persistent. Fear <laughs> is a deep driver of this. 
I don't have time to elaborate, but there are wonderful articles by psychologists, social psychologists, neuroscientists, uh, and uh, conflict resolution specialists emphasizing the role of fear really as a subcortical, fast, uh, reactive kind of decision-making to move from the lower right cell in conflict to the upper left cell in cooperation is a cognitive act. Uh, it's not an emotional act. It's a cognitive act. And fear derails that kind of cognitive act to an important extent. So what are some potential partial answers which nobody has found? I would say first, group rights, especially for minority groups within a political framework. The search for universals in ethics, and I think that's where Alama Iqbal really comes into this. An ethics of tolerance, which is a special kind of ethics, which I'll come to in a moment. Intergroup dialogue, social and political structures of mediation, and shared culture, uh, which is extremely important. Arts, sports, music, literature. I really object to and disagree fundamentally with the call, for example, of excluding Russian athletes from the 2024 Olympics. This is the opposite of what we need to find peace in the world. And the Ukrainian demands to exclude Russian athletes or to stop playing Tchaikovsky or to stop Russian ballets is mind bogglingly wrong. It's the opposite of what we need for peace. So I am a huge believer that ancient wisdom can help us to find solutions, whether it is Confucius uh, or, uh, or the Buddha or Aristotle or Averroes, uh, uh, shown in the lower right, or the prophet uh, Isaiah, as imagined by Michelangelo on the Sistine Chapel, there is a commonality of views across the great face that I think is what uh, Alama Iqbal was searching for, and that is vital if we're going to find an end to this kind of conflict. So I would argue that there are at least six shared pillars of ancient wisdom across the Greeks, Jewish and Christian traditions, Islamic trad Islamic faith, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, and other ancient wisdom traditions. First, they're all based on virtue ethics, that the way to well-being is by building our characters, which I think is a fundamental point. It was not the dominant form of ethics uh, in uh, the English and Germanic world in the last three centuries, but it's making a very strong comeback. And I think virtue ethics is the right form of ethics, uh, more than deontological uh, or utilitarian ethics, because it puts ethics as the core of individual responsibility, like you quoted uh, Iqbal as emphasizing. Second, it emphasizes that human struggle between lower urges, let's cheat and take advantage, uh, and a higher calling, let's cooperate because that's the right thing to do. It calls on reason of various kinds as being fundamental on the path to reaching that higher calling. It says that we need a vision of perfection. And this is where I think spirituality or religion is fundamental. And that is true from Plato and Aristotle through the various faiths that uh, God or the first mover or the idea of the ideal uh, form is the sense of perfection and the responsibility of humans to strive for something better. Iqbal emphasized that science and the spiritual are conjoined. And I think ancient wisdom strongly emphasizes this point, the idea that religion and science are antithetical in some way is actually a modern idea. It is not the idea of ancient wisdom and fundamentally that there is a single human family 
And I think not only uh, the modern genetics of uh, Homo sapiens proves this, uh, and our knowledge of uh, the uh, single human family in the migration from Africa around 70,000 years ago, but the idea that we can find a common spirit as the basis of our shared humanity, despite our distinctive faiths and cultures, is a shared view of all of these ancient wisdom traditions. So, of course, Iqbal, uh, as uh, a great thinker uh, and philosopher, as well as a poet, and I can't vouch for his poetry through translation, but I can vouch for his wisdom in this wonderful book uh, of uh, the reconstruction of religious thought in Islam, offered the goal of Islam as a message for all humanity, uh, not a message for the believers, a message for all humanity. And he argued that we need to search for rational foundations, uh, science, and Islam. Uh, he quotes the prophet as saying, God grant me knowledge of the ultimate nature of things as this search for truth, and that the purpose uh, of the Quran, he says, is to awaken in man the higher consciousness of his manifold relations with God and the universe. And he gives in this spirit of a geopolitics of peace, he said, in every corner of the world, speaking in 1938, the spirit of freedom and the dignity of man are being trampled underfoot in a way to which not even the darkest period of history presents a parallel, anticipating what was to come, but calling for a world of universal human dignity. And he closed, and I thank uh, Professor Malik for uh, sharing this uh, wonderful quotation with me, that only one unity is dependable, and that is unity of the brotherhood of man, which is above race, nationality, color, or language, so long as men do not demonstrate by their actions that they believe that the whole world is the family of God, they will never be able to lead a happy and contented life, and the beautiful ideals of liberty, equality, and fraternity will never be realized. A single human family. I think we still have the makings of this, though it's extraordinarily fragile. We are the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is the closest we've ever come as humanity to expressing a common shared ideal. This was brought to fruition by Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the remarkable wife of our remarkable president, and she was absolutely remarkable in, in every way, and brought together philosophers and theologians uh, and uh, leaders from across the world and from all faiths to forge the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it is based on the idea that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. So just to conclude, we have different kinds of conflicts. We need different kinds of remedies. We need different kinds of institutional approaches. I will leave the slides uh, with uh, the uh, Oxford Pakistan program for you to look at uh, in your leisure and to communicate back with me your ideas. I am sachs at columbia.edu. Uh, easy to find and easy to uh, share thoughts with. I believe that the United Nations, which was the greatest idea of our greatest president, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, remains <coughs> indispensable for our survival, even as its fragility is evident in the face of great power politics, private greed, and state impunity. So the world's very difficult. The UN has a very difficult time functioning in a difficult world, but it remains, in my view, our best hope for the universal human family. Let me close with words of President John F. Kennedy. I opened with his words, and I'll close with his words on my favorite speech of his, and it's my favorite speech by an American president in modern history. You can find it online. 
It's called his peace speech. It was given on June 10, 1963. It was a speech asking the American people to change their attitudes towards the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union are human beings too who want peace. Can you imagine at the height of the Cold War, an American president saying we need to empathize with the other side so that we can forge peace? When he gave this speech, Nikita Khrushchev heard it, called the American envoy in Moscow, Avril Harriman, and said, this is the finest speech by an American president since Franklin Roosevelt. I want to sign a peace agreement with your president. Six weeks later, the partial nuclear test ban treaty was signed. This is how to get from the lower right to the upper left corner. Empathy, humanity, decency, speaking to the other side. So I'll just close with President Kennedy's words from that speech. So let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and to the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future and we are all mortal. Thank you very much. May I now request Professor Richard Kaplan, who is a professor of international relations at the Department of Politics and International Relations at Oxford, to offer his brief uh, discussion. It is a very great honor to share the podium with Professor Jeffrey Sachs. And uh, it is. <laughs> Very difficult to follow such an inspiring and engaging lecture as we've heard this afternoon. In, however, the few minutes that are available to me, what I would like to do um, is really just make a few observations. It's, it's difficult, if not impossible, to do justice to a lecture as rich and wide ranging as, as you have just delivered. So. I will limit myself, as I said, to just a couple of observations. Professor Sachs, I think, has very nicely encapsulated and reflected upon some of the leading contemporary thinking about geopolitics. With his slide on uh, description versus prescription, one is reminded of Karl Marx's thesis on Feuerbach. I'm sure you don't fashion yourself a Marxist, but I hear an echo uh, where Marx stated philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. Implicit in Professor Sachs's analysis here, and I would say explicit in some of your writings, is the view that realism, whether classical or contemporary, is fundamentally flawed because it places too much emphasis on competition as the driver of international relations and underestimates the scope for cooperation. And this is where description and prescription converge, because if realists are wrong and greater cooperation among nations is possible, then it's arguably incumbent upon national leaders and for that matter, we, social scientists, to exploit the opportunity for cooperation inherent in international relations, because greater cooperation is precisely what is needed to address global environmental crises, global financial crises, global health crises, and so forth. The difficulty, as I see it, is that while there is always scope for greater cooperation, and we have witnessed such cooperation in the past, this is not a pipe dream, 
Think about the eradication of smallpox and polio, the dramatic reduction of the ozone hole, the lifting of millions of people out of poverty, and the elimination of an entire class or classes of, of lethal weapons, none of which could have been achieved without with states acting entirely on their own. But it's still the case that states can do and will resist the pressures to act in concert towards recognized common goals, goals which they themselves recognize as, as sharing and even as a necessity for survival. Now, why is that? Why is it that they resist these pressures? The reasons are complex, but one factor is a short-sightedness, a short-sightedness which manifests itself in two ways. One is the de-intensification of the threats that we face. Now, for many, for instance, global warming may be a present reality, not denied. There are those who deny, of course may be acknowledged as a present reality, but it is still a distant threat in the minds of many people. I would say in the minds of most people. And second, the attraction of and drive for short-term gains, putting profits before people, whether it's corporate greed, personal aggrandizement, or electoral advantage. Now, Professor Sachs quotes John F. Kennedy, if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can make the world safe for diversity. These are laudable words, but did JFK and the United States generally strive to make the world safe for diversity? Safe for governments that wished to liberate themselves from colonial or neo-colonial rule? Think Vietnam, think East Timor, safe for governments that sought to elevate public welfare above the profits of multinational corporations. Think about Guatemala, 1954, Chile under Allende. One could understand why Mearsheiber's book is titled The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. What we need and what Professor Sachs has promised us in one of his essays, and I think hinted at towards the end of your lecture tonight, is a roadmap for achieving 21st century multilateralism. But it has to be meaningful multilateralism. And I fear that without such a roadmap, and I don't see that we've been guided by one, even before Ukraine, notwithstanding the examples that you've cited, without such a roadmap, Cooperation to the degree required, I fear, will remain elusive. So I think it's fair to say that we share, you and I, the same aspiration for cooperation, for multilateralism. I'm perhaps more mindful of the obstacles to achieving that. But thank you again for a very stimulating lecture. Thank you very much for your patience. I realize that uh, we are running late, but we'll still have 15 minutes, if possible, for Q&A. Um, so there's a question here. Maybe you have... Do we have a mic? Um, thank you so much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. My name is Rachel. I'm doing a doctorate at Oxford, actually under a deal. Um, two quick points, one quicker than the second. Um, I think in, in looking for solutions to inter-ethnic conflict, I would punt to my own doctoral research, which suggests that looking at bridging economic inequality between different ethnic groups um, helps to build peace. So I think an inter-ethnic um, environments, there's often this push to like bring communities together. But I think that if you increase the incomes of different ethnic groups, those groups will come together much more easily. Um, my second main point is about your discussion and comparison between Ukraine and China. I think your 
um, understanding of um, America being the primarily provocative actor with China, I would agree. But I think in Ukraine, it strikes me as, as that Russia is the primary provocateur. Um, and perhaps you know something more than I do. But in terms of your um, game theory comparison, I would argue that that game theory is, is, is repeated. That game is repeated between Europe, the US and, and Russia. And I would say that when Russia invaded Ukraine, they escalated and the US de-escalated and Russia ended up with all 10 points. And so I can understand when that game is repeated and um, Russia invades all of Ukraine, there is um, the feeling that perhaps a response is something that's required to block Russia from, from being a bully in Eastern Europe, basically. And the reason I would say this, this, the second thing I would say to support this is that I don't see, and perhaps again, you have more information than I do, that the US or Europe has done something to actively pull Ukraine towards itself. It strikes me that it was increasingly Ukraine's decision to align more closely with Europe because of its internal domestic political decisions. And actually Ukraine has tried to enter the European Union in the past, and that's been turned down by Europe in an effort to ally Russian concerns. So my feeling is that very clearly that Europe and the West have been more inclined in the Ukrainian issue to de-escalate and that Russia has been the primary escalator in, in that case. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your lecture. Uh, returning to the Ukraine war, sadly, I was unsurprised and I continue being unsurprised by the logic of actions on either side in this war, uh, much as one deprecates it, uh, because they all seem to be acting out some script of the kind that you have described. What really surprised me is the um, a response of the rest of the world outside the West. For the first time, you see an extraordinary coincidence, perhaps, uh, of small, medium, and large powers choosing uh, to renege from even taking a position. And this is not just non-alignment, because we are no longer in that kind of bipolar world. Uh, does it represent a kind of entirely novel form of, albeit coincidental maturity, political maturity. Even countries which are normally understood as client states of, say, Western powers, uh, or which shelter under the US military umbrella, have proven recalcitrant and resistant. And that, I think, is something utterly new. I wonder whether... And of course, what this does is provincialize the war insofar as it's possible to provincialize it. It brings up for the first time since the war on terror, the principle of neutrality mm -hmm. for good or for ill that allows for uh, a connection between the rival uh, powers or countries involved. Uh, and it seems to presage the making of a new kind of international order, hopefully. And I come back to the war on terror here, actually, because it seems to me that war, which <laughs> destroyed both the UN order, which was completely bypassed during it, uh, and the T that has been historic of international relations and of all international order in the past, is it possible to see these things coming back via, if you will, the non-West, even though in a non-concerted way? And if so, would not a new international order really be the golden opportunity in this otherwise very grave and dark moment that we face? Except it could never be just the return of the old UN, which was hollowed out. It would have to be something uh, altered something newer, just as the UN itself replaced the League of Nations, um, which was its, itself destroyed after the First World War. Uh, I wonder if you could say something about the, the fascinating role 
that, if you will, the coincidental non-West is playing uh, in our moment, right. unseen before in history. Right. Excellent. Maybe one more, because yeah. these are long uh, <laughs> questions. Uh, and uh, since we only have till 10 this evening, uh, <laughs> maybe one more question. Oh. We'll have another round. I'm... Mm. I'm going to uh, thank you. Time. My name is Mohammed. I'm a <clears throat> I'm a master's student from Djibouti. Um, a very interesting lecture. But I was wondering last week, uh, the Ch uh, People's Republic of China announced a 12 points plan on a resolution to the conflict in Ukraine. I'm wondering if a brief question, if you could just comment on those 12 points and how do you see that as realigning sort of the the traditional roles of all these major comment plans? on the 12 points of the Chinese government's peace plan for Ukraine. Oh, the 12 point. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Perfect. Okay. So why don't we just, if you don't mind, take a pause for seven or eight minutes on Ukraine, just to give you my own sense of what's happening, uh, which is actually close to John Mearsheimer in certain ways. And I've seen a lot of this uh, firsthand. Basically, uh, the idea that this is a provoked war is an idea that the United States uh, acted in a way which Russian leaders understandably viewed as deeply threatening Russia's security. I believe that to be the case. And that goes back 30 years now. And so let me explain briefly. Gorbachev was a, a miracle for the world because he believed in unilaterally disbanding the Warsaw Pact military alliance of the Soviet Union and making a peace between the Soviet Union and the West, and the West meaning the United States and Europe, basically. And this was a dream unimaginable, really, that this could happen. But it did happen. And I attribute a great deal of it to uh, not even to Russia's or the Soviet Union's weakness, though that was undoubted, and need for reform, but actually to the extraordinary decency of this leader and the search for a, a way uh, forward peacefully. At the time that Gorbachev made this move, the United States and Germany, especially Germany because it was interested in German reunification, made very clear that the West would not take advantage of the Soviets' unilateral action by expanding the U.S. military alliance eastward. This is not a myth. This is hard facts. And you can find this on uh, the uh, George Washington University archives, uh, what Gorbachev heard. You can find that online if you and all of the underlying documentation. And if you can't find it, email me and I will give you the, the links. I know this from 30 years ago. And the U.S. had a different view. The U.S. starting in 1992 took the view that now we were in a U.S.-led world, a unipolar world, and that the U.S. could do what it wanted. And it aimed to do what it wanted. The authors of this were in both political parties, in the Republican Party, especially Cheney, Wolfowitz, Rumsfeld, in the Democratic Party, Hillary Clinton, uh, Victoria Nuland, President Biden, and others. This is a doctrine which is rightly called neoconservatism, but it's a doctrine of U.S. exceptionalism and unipolarity, that the U.S. aim is dominance, what they call full-spectrum dominance, meaning military, technological, and economic dominance of the United States in every major region of the world. 
in the mid 1990s, there was a huge fight inside the US government between those who said, don't expand NATO, you will wreck relations with Russia. And those who said, we're the United States, we do what we want. In the end, Clinton went with the, we do what we want school of thought. And the first NATO expansion took place, uh, expanding to Poland, the Czech Republic, and uh, Hungary. That raised tensions with Russia. And the greatest statesman of and scholar of US Russian relations in our modern history, George Kennan, said this will lead to a new Cold War, declaring that in 1997. The Secretary of Defense at the time, Bill Perry, thought about resigning in protest. He was so upset with the decision to expand NATO because he regarded it as a basic violation of promises as well as a basic provocation to Russia. Now, I can tell you that first expansion was taken badly, but it did not lead to this war. The next step was 1999. For a variety of reasons, NATO bombed Serbia 48 straight days to break Serbia in two and to break Kosovo outside of Serbia. It was disgraceful, in my opinion. That was the first war in Europe since World War II, not the Ukraine war. It was directed at Russia's close ally, and it was directed at regime change, period and to break Serbia. That raised the temperature a little bit higher. Then came 9-11, and President Putin immediately said to the United States, I will help you, we will cooperate together. But then came two terrible decisions. First, the United States unilaterally walked out of the anti-ballistic missile treaty in 2002. This was taken as a direct and immediate threat to Russia because it meant the possibility of the United States looking for a first strike potential against Russia. It was a unilateral action by one of our worst governments in our modern history. I keep saying that they keep getting worse. So, uh, but at the time I thought this is pretty bad, uh, George W. Bush Jr. Then in 2003 came the completely unprovoked Iraq war on completely false pretenses, cooked up phony intelligence to launch a war of regime change again. That raised temperatures further. <laughs> then in 2004, the United States expanded NATO seven times to Lithuania. Latvia, Estonia, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, and Slovenia. If you look at a map, it's like the water rising. ABM treaty, bombing Serbia, NATO expansion to the Black Sea, to the Baltics. Temperatures are getting very high. And in the 2007 Munich Security Summit, Putin said, stop, you are threatening our core security. Stop. So what did the United States do? In 2008, it said, we will expand NATO to Ukraine and to Georgia. Take a look at the map to understand what this is about. The goal is to surround Russia in the Black Sea. This is an explicit understanding because then you have Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, Georgia, completely surrounding the Russian fleet in Sevastopol. That's the goal. Then Russia is unable to project any power in the Eastern Mediterranean or the Middle East. Putin told Bush in 
Bucharest in 2008. You do this, you will find out this is absolutely our red line. Don't do this. At the time, European leaders spoke to me, said, what is your president doing? This is completely reckless. Of course, European leaders don't say this publicly, but they do say it to me because I'm friends with them, because I've known them for a long time. This is part of the lying that goes on. So 2008 was a watershed. Then came 2011. In 2011, President Obama instructed the CIA and other parts of the U.S. government to overthrow Bashar al-Assad in Syria. This was a U.S. regime change operation. The war broke out because of the United States arming a mercenary army together with Saudi Arabia to overthrow Assad. There would have been no war but for the United States. In 2012, the UN negotiated an end to the Syrian war. It was rejected by one country, the United States, because the US said, we insist on regime change as a predicate for ending this war. None of this you will find in the media because by now the media have stopped reporting almost any truths that are inconvenient. I know this firsthand from the highest authorities. Then in 2014, the United States helped to overthrow the Ukrainian government. Have no doubt about it. You can even listen to the tape of Victoria Nuland, who was then the Assistant Secretary of State, speaking to the U.S. Ambassador in Ukraine, Jeffrey Piat, about who's going to come into the government two weeks before the overthrow. I know firsthand about this. The United States helped to pay for the Maidan revolution, so-called, the protests, the demonstrations, and the violence that came, came from the Ukrainian side, not from the security forces of Yanukovych. This was a coup. You, this is important to understand because those are the first shots of the war. A U.S. overthrow or a U.S. supported overthrow of the Ukrainian government. Now, what was Yanukovych doing that was so upsetting to the US? He was pursuing neutrality. He was against NATO enlargement. And the US overthrew him. And a very Russophobic, highly nationalist government came into power with the US backing the next day ended the neutrality, even passed a law outlawing the Russian language one day, though not implemented. But that was the beginning of the war. You, uh, the month after uh, Russia retook Crimea, many Russian forces in the Ukrainian military broke away from the military, took their equipment, and started the insurrection in Lugansk and Donetsk. These were Ukrainian weapons that came from contingents of the Ukrainian army. The fighting started in eastern Ukraine at that time. The United States sent billions of dollars of weapons to Ukraine during the period 2014 to 2021, building Ukraine's army and modernizing it which is why it could fight as effectively as it did this past year. All of the fortifications, the cities turned into fortresses, the heavy 
uh, heavy armaments. That was billions of dollars of U.S. funding to arm an anti-Russian regime that it had helped bring to power. I think by now, Putin was a little annoyed, if I could put it that way. None of this history is recounted in our media, in our politics, in our discussion, because everything is that for an unprovoked reason, because Putin thinks he's Peter the Great, he launched a war for no other reason than imperial expansion on February 24, 2022. That is a lie, ladies and gentlemen. This goes back 30 years, and the United States has behaved horribly because the U.S. should not move its military alliance to the more than 1,000 kilometer border of Russia. And this is the mistake. So at the end of 2021, President Putin put down three demands. One was neutrality. The second was Crimea remains part of Russia as Crimea has been the home to the Black Sea fleet since 1783. And the third is that the Minsk II agreement should be implemented as Europe and Ukraine had promised, but then reneged on. The United States refused to negotiate. I know it because I spoke to the White House then and said, what are you doing? This is the basis for peace. You can avoid this war. Just make clear NATO is not enlarging and the war will not happen. They would not do it because this has been a long standing project. Then they say this has nothing to do with NATO. If it has nothing to do with NATO, all the United States has to do tomorrow is to say NATO is not enlarging. Then we can test that theory versus my theory. But they won't say it. Why? Because they haven't thought about it? I don't think so because they have an intention to expand NATO. And that is the goal. And if it's not the goal, then they are so unbelievably irresponsible not to have tried the alternative that it is unimaginable. This is not to justify an invasion and the killing. It is to help you understand it. And most importantly, it is to help you to understand that there is a way for this war to end. That's the point. The way for this war to end, in my view, is President Biden picks up the phone and says, President Putin, NATO will not expand to Ukraine. Now let's talk. I may be wrong, but without trying that, I find it an egregious destruction of Ukraine, first and foremost, that's going on. I am not pro-Putin. I am pro-Ukraine. I want the killing to stop. I want us to try to end this war. I want us to understand the basic reason for this war, or if it's not the reason, to prove it. And this comes to your excellent question. Most of the world leaders I know around the world believe this is a war of NATO expansion. They believe this is a US-Russia proxy war. Maybe it's not, but then the United States has been the most failed diplomacy in the whole world because if really this is not right, all they have to do is say it. And the fact that they won't say it either shows a level of incomprehension and irresponsibility that is beyond my fathoming, or it shows a duplicity, which I believe to be the case. But on the substance, my view is that this neoconservative group 
has been in charge of U.S. foreign policy since 1992. I think it has been an abject disaster for the United States. Mm -hmm. It has helped to create the war in Ukraine. It's bringing us absolutely to the risk of World War III in East Asia over Taiwan. Same kind of approach, same kind of provocations, mm -hmm. shipping more arms to Taiwan, not respecting the one China policy, not having proper dialogue. All of it is utterly irresponsible. The world senses this now. So the United States and Europe did not isolate Russia at all. Russia trades with all of the rest of the world, with Africa, with Latin America, and with Asia. When you count the votes at the UN, if you count them by population, roughly 60 to 70% of the world always refuses to vote with the West. The West gets somewhere between 20 and 30% of the vote, most typically. This is a Western project, and it is a Western project either because of the most absurd failure of diplomacy or because they're not telling the truth. Either way, it's a failure of the West to put it this way.